Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Monday, April 28th, 2014, and here are our top stories. Tonight, bankers' biggest secrets have now gone mainstream. Then, a mysterious plane returns to Russia for the fourth straight day. And how taxpayers fund decadent sports owners. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. In Hollywood, you drive into a big gate with armed guards, and then there'll be another gate in a neighborhood. You get into another gate, and then there'll be another gate on that house, and then a security office. Well, to underscore just how high tensions are in the Ukraine with Russia, Paul Joseph Watson writes that the Russian doomsday plane has been active now for a fourth consecutive day. This is Russia's Tupolev Tu-T-14SR, Moscow's version of the US E-4B, has been flying for the fourth consecutive day. It illustrates how Ukraine is descending into civil war. Now, this is a plane that typically shadows Putin, and as he points out, they may be using it as a decoy, but still, the fact that it's in the air for four days shows that they're concerned to either hide his presence or to protect wherever he is. Now, of course, this is a conflict that InfoWars has pointed out many times is being pushed by the IMF, by bankers, by financiers like George Soros. We don't want the bankers creating another war. But it's interesting that the mainstream financial press is waking up to the fact and criticizing the fact that the bankers are not just creating wars, but creating money. This is an article from Washington's blog. The biggest secret about banking has just gone mainstream. He points out that They've proven now that loans come first and then deposits follow. And this is really from the Financial Times' Martin Wolf, one of the world's most influential mainstream financial writers, as he points out. He says that banks create money out of thin air, and because they do, they should be stripped out of this power and limited to normal depository functions. Here's what Wolf said in the story. He said, printing counterfeit banknotes is illegal. But creating private money is not. And this is a source of instability in our markets. And then he underscores it with this quote. This giant hole at the heart of our market economies needs to be plugged. Now, this was also picked up by Business Insider. And the article there is ban all the banks. Here's the wild idea that people are starting to take seriously. And he points out that essentially the modern banking system represents the outsourcing of money creation from the federal government to the banking system. And again, he quotes economist uh, Martin Wolf, who calls for stripping the banks of their right to create money. He says that since they're creating this money ex nihilo, they're responsible for destabilizing credit bubbles and for creating busts. And he says, if the government is going to have to end up backstopping everything as it currently is, why not just have the government be the source of money creation? And finally, they go back to a 1939 proposal from a very famous economist, Irving Fisher, who was analyzing what could be done in the wake of the Great Depression. And here's what he said in his paper. He said, the chief loose screw in our present American money and banking system is a requirement of only fractional reserves behind demand deposits. Finally, they look at this article and they ask, what can be done? Will this happen? And again, they go back to a quote from Martin Wolf, and he says, this will not happen now. But remember the possibility when the next crisis comes, and it surely will. We need to be ready. Take that as a warning if you're a banker. Now, we know where the that they're creating the money. Who gets this money? Well, we give the money, in many cases, to welfare professional sports team owners. And, of course, one of them has been in the news quite a lot lately. This is a guy who is a bona fide racist, who is a bona fide welfare recipient. Compare him to Cliven Bundy, the guy that they took his, the New York Times, took his contents out of context and severely edited them to try to make him look like a racist. This guy, Donald Sterling, really is a racist, and he really is a welfare queen. This guy is getting over 233 times the amount of money that Clive and Bundy is accused of not paying in his grazing rights dispute with the BLM. And of course, this money is just given to him. Look at what he got in 1999. This is an article that was put out. Bear Stearns financed this and announced that the transaction when they created the Staples Center, where Don Sterling's team is now playing, they said this transaction was the largest ever financing for a professional sports arena. He got $70 million. This is where the money goes. Now, of course, this guy who's going to be honored by the NAACP as the Lifetime Achievement Award, the same group was going to give Reverend Al Sharpton 
a person of the year award. Here's this guy who was a drug dealer for the mafia. He was a made man inside the mafia. Then he becomes an FBI snitch. And of course, he's the person of the year. And then the person who's going to get the lifetime achievement is the guy who is running his welfare sports team as if he was a plantation owner with the same attitude, the same racist attitude. Understand that professional sports players, first they go through the college system, of course, they get paid nothing, even though coaches and universities are making millions off of this. Then they have a situation where they're treated as chattel, being traded from place to place. And then finally, they get kicked to the curb when their short career of fame and fortune is over. And this is the group of people that this professional sports team owner who gets millions of dollars, and of course, $70 million was a lot back in 1999, but of course, now they get hundreds of millions of dollars, getting approaching close to a billion dollars in welfare for these wealthy sports team owners. But, you know, he's not the only one. Look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example. Here's a guy that the Simon Wiesenthal Center was going to give an award to, even though he had clear Nazi connections. They said he may be the son of a Nazi, but Arnold will get a Jewish award. Now, this is from the LA Times back when he was getting this honor, and they point out that even though there was an unauthorized biography that reported a lot of connections between him and his father, and of course his father was a Nazi in Austria, he volunteered for the SA and was an officer in the SA. And of course, there were reports in 1992 from Spy Magazine that Arnold enjoyed playing and giving away records of Hitler's speeches. He thought that Hitler was a great man and made those comments on film reportedly in the Pumping Iron documentary. Of course, they did not use that in the final version. And then he said, I didn't think about money. I thought about fame, about just being the greatest. I was dreaming about being some dictator. Well, you know, Arnold, if you want to be a dictator, probably the best place to be is in American politics, because it seems like that's, <laughs> that's where everybody is acting like a dictator. But it's not just him. It's our current dictator in chief again, Obama, winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Look at that. Scorsese has absolutely no reason to win the Peace Prize. Look at when he first took office, and this is a story from the Huffington Post. They said, the announcement drew gasps of surprise and cries of too much, too soon. Yet President Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize because the judges found his promise, his promise of disarmament and diplomacy just too good to ignore. So how's that promise working out for you now? Obama, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, is now the drone assassin. And of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Nazi sympathizer, gets awards from the Jews. And then we've got a guy who runs a plantation system for his professional sports team and holds the people there in utter racist contempt. And of course, he was going to get the person of the year. Fortunately, the NAACP has now taken that back. But what do you get? Well, you get singled out for <laughs> loaded weapons in your face when an automatic license plate reader misreads your tag. Look at this story from Tim Cushing at Tech Dirt. Cops draw weapons on driver after license plate reader misreads his plate. Now, according to the Prairie Village Post, earlier this month, lawyer Mark Molner was driving through a Kansas City suburb on his way home from his wife's sonogram. That's right, a pregnant wife who sees this from a parked car nearby. All of a sudden, his BMW is blocked in front by a police car as another officer in a motorcycle pulls up behind him. He said, he did not point the weapon at me, but he definitely had his gun out of his holster. I'm guessing that he saw the shock and the horror on my face and realized that I was unlikely to make more of a scene. Well, what they did was the automatic license plate reader read a seven instead of a two, and it returned it as a stolen vehicle. And of course, they doubled down and said that if he was 100% sure the officer would have been able to conduct a felony car stop, which means that both officers would have been pointing guns at him while they gave him commands to exit the vehicle. This sounds just like Terry Gilliam's Brazil, where they mistake Buttle for Tuttle and a guy gets a full-on SWAT team raid. But this is what we have always warned about. When they start using this universal surveillance and start triggering things, just like they did with this automatic license plate reader, they're going to be looking at people who maybe are bending down to change a tire. And that might look very much like somebody's trying to steal a car. And we know that since the police are so trigger happy and are so quick to shoot first, this is going to cost innocent lives unless we change the rules of engagement. And there's no better example of that than this story from the Mail Online, which is talking about an officer in Knoxville, Tennessee. A Tennessee sheriff's deputy is fired 
after he was caught on camera choking an unresisting college student until he passed out. Now, fortunately, he was fired, but this is really amazing. Look at these pictures. This student, this college student, has his, now, of course, he was accused of having a cup that smelled like it had alcohol. And there were a lot of college students that were very unruly that were throwing things at the cops, so it got the cops' blood up. But look what they did. They've got him handcuffed behind his back, and this cop in front, the one, that's the one they, that you see right there, he's the one that was fired. He is choking this guy unconscious. The guy is offering absolutely no resistance. The other two officers are just as guilty. They're standing by, holding his arms behind his back where he's handcuffed. This is what we're seeing all the time. This is what we were really concerned about at the Bundy Ranch. This is why it became a national story, why Paul Joseph Watson picked it up. The details are very complicated. We believe, I believe certainly, that Bundy has a very good legal case on some issues. It brings up a lot of very good points that need to be looked at in terms of the jurisdiction between the state and federal government, in terms of what's going to happen with Agenda 21 and endangered species. But the key thing here, the key thing, was a bureaucracy that was over the top, using snipers to point weapons at unarmed people, setting up free speech areas where they censored anybody complaining about this, and attacking people who crossed their lines. This is what we have to contend with. And we have coming up at the end of the program, Ron Paul pointing out that this was exactly what was going to happen back in 1997. But before we get there, let's look at another aspect that has surfaced from this Nevada ranch standoff. And that, of course, is Harry Reid's corruption and ethics issues. And that's an issue that is not going away. A new probe, this is reported by The New American, a new probe confirms Harry Reid's long history of corruption. This is a two-part investigation that was done by Real Clear Politics. This is now being reported by The New American. We have reported many different instances. And they point out that he arrived, Harry Reid did, arrived in Washington in 1983 as the only congressman from Nevada. And at that time, he only had a net worth of about a million dollars. And now it's easily over $10 million. And of course, they don't have that exactly because the land, he's heavily invested in real estate, <laughs> like 90% of it he looks at as if it were his personal fiefdom that he can broker to globalist capitalists. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about the tips that they give him. I'm talking about the massive amount of real estate that he's got there, which of course varies in value depending on what Harry Reid does. And the article continues and says, he has built a dizzying network of mutually beneficial political, personal, and business alliances. And these associations benefit Reid, his family, his close friends, and very often the state. A lot of people are gonna be looking at these alliances and associations and what it means to Harry Reid, to his son, Rory Reid to his hand-picked director for the BLM, Neil Kornza, and Kornza's father, who is connected on many of the largest mining companies' board of directors. We're gonna be following this story, and there are a lot of other people who are now following Dirty Harry's connections. Now, the question in Nevada, as in many other places, is out west, does the Constitution allow for the federal government to retain ownership of, in the case of Nevada, 90% of federal land after it moves from a territory to a state? You know, does the Constitution even matter to the American public, to the government for that, for that matter? Well, right after the break, Joe Biggs is going to be asking people on the street what they think about the Constitution. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.